back, everyone. Happy New Year. First day of classes. I saw the hustle and bustle earlier, earlier today as I saw students everywhere trying to cross the street at about noon. <laughs> um, the board did meet in closed session today, and uh, we considered a claim for damages filed by a private citizen with the initials AM against the district. Um, AM claimed she suffered medical and property damage stemming from a traffic collision in June of 2014, which she claimed was caused by a COS student worker. After consideration, the board voted 5-0 to reject the claim. Um, with that, we will start out with our pledge. And Jennifer, will you please lead us in our pledge? Ready, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Now we have the privilege and opportunity to welcome and deliver the oath of office to Jennifer, who is our new student rep. Welcome. Thank we look you. forward to working with you for the next few months and getting to know you better and hope we can hear you speak up and enlighten us on what uh, matters to students. Your, your voice is really important to us and we, we hope you will speak out. Can you join me over here at the podium, Jennifer? <coughs> Yep, that's fine. If you would raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, and then state your name. I, Jennifer Cho. <coughs> do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies. Foreign and, domestic. foreign and domestic, that I swear I will bear, that I swear I will bear true, faith and allegiance true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Congratulations. <laughs> the first big test is always doing the oath of office. <laughs> Well, I like the way you do the oath of office. You, you, you only Break say two or three that. words, yeah, yeah. and sometimes you say too many and you can't remember what he said. <laughs> you get to that without, <laughs> in smaller portion. without mental reservation. By that time, you're ready to say, no, I don't want this. <laughs> Greg gets to remember, she's younger than you are. So. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, can you just take a couple of minutes and just tell us um, where you graduated high school, what your plans are, where you grew up? I am born and raised here in Visalia, California. I attended Golden West High School, and I just graduated in 2014, so this is only my second semester here at COS, but I am absolutely ecstatic. I've been able to, I've been privileged enough to take part in Student Senate and um, apply for the National Leadership Conference and play sports for the school and everything, so yeah. It's what sports? I play tennis for the school. Okay. Yeah. And what's your area of study, Jennifer? I'm an accounting major. Oh man, <laughs> Abby must have recruited you. Huh? Actually, it's a little shocking how much we have in similar. It's like hello, trippy. <laughs> okay. okay. And well, what are your plans after COS? I'm sorry. Well, currently I'm looking into different UCs. Um, honestly, I'm open to any school that has a good business program, and I've looked into UC, UC Santa Barbara, UC Riverside, and um, some CSUs as well. Okay. Very good. Okay. Well, welcome, board members. Do you have any questions of Jennifer? We'll be calling upon you. <laughs> um, okay, uh, moving on to uh, public comment. For board policy 2350, any person may address the board at this time. <coughs> either on an agenda item or other matters of, of interest to the public that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. A maximum of five minutes is allowed for each speaker with a maximum of 15 minutes per item unless otherwise extended by the board. 
Do we have any public comments concerning items on the agenda? Concerning items not on the agenda? I know. Oh, okay, come on. Go ahead. If you could please state your name at the podium. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity to address the Board of Trustees of COS. My name is Cynthia Norval. I'm the school nurse here at COS, arriving on this campus in September of 2013. I'm here to talk to you about something that's going to be taking place later this month. We're very excited about it. <coughs> and the goal of this is to share this information with as many people as possible to ensure the success of our attempt to help the students here at COS. Food insecurity is defined as the state of being without reliable access to a sufficient quantity of affordable, nutritious food. COS has a food insecurity task force. In terms of history, it was established in November of 2013. The Health Center, excuse me, in November of 2013, the Health Center participated in the soup day out in the quad. And during this event, they conducted a food insecurity survey, which revealed that 37% of the 73 students surveyed suffered from food insecurity. First year experience repeated that same survey and it was conducted in January of 2014 and they sent it to all COS students. Of the 802 students surveyed, 53% reported some type of food insecurity in their household. The Health Center Coordinator, Patty Alvarez, shared these results via, camp via Campus E! News, at which time numerous COS employees volunteered to work together to address this very important concern. On January 28th, 2014, the COS Food and Security Task Force convened its first meeting, and the health center employees, together with members of the COS administration, classified staff, faculty, and members of local organizations joined to aid our students' needs. At this inaugural meeting, representatives of Food Link of Tulare County provided information regarding a program entitled Nutrition on the Go. This program commenced on March 4, 2014, and continues to provide monthly distribution of fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables at the Visalia campus. Because COS Hanford is located in Kings County, the Food and Security Task Force approached Community Food Bank of Fresno in an effort to explore partnership opportunities for the Hanford campus. Because the Hanford campus does not have staff sufficient to operate a food pantry, bags of food from the Visalia Food Pantry are provided in order to serve the Hanford student population. However, the partnership with the Community Food Bank of Fresno created an opportunity for the Tulare campus to participate in a program entitled Neighborhood Market. This program is similar to Nutrition on the Go in that it brings fresh fruits and vegetables to the Visalia campus. The first neighborhood market took place on November 13, 2014 and will continue on a monthly basis much like Nutrition on the Go continues on the Visalia campus. Partnership with Foodlink has grown to include snack stations, programs which offer students snacks at various locations throughout the campus, CalWORKs, foster care education, FYE, the health center, and athletics. These snacks are supported weekly by Foodlink. At the February 2014 meeting of the FIT Task Force, another effort to address food insecurity was developed. Food Friday was initiated and encouraged the donation of non-perishable food items, which could be placed in bins distributed throughout the campus. While this effort initially met with a small degree of success, interest eventually waned. In September of 2014, the Health Center invested approximately $500 for a limited restocking of the emergency <coughs> food pantry. In order to supplement this emergency food pantry inventory, a campus-wide food drive was launched in October of 2014 and netted 595 pounds of non-perishable food items. This additional inventory created an opportunity for us to now advertise the food pantry. We were skeptical about offering it because we had a limited resource. After this food drive, we were actually able to advertise. It was a great accomplishment. It was during the October food drive that the Tulare campus seized this opportunity to conduct their own food drive and now stock and offer an emergency food pantry on the Tulare campus. To date, approximately 55 students have visited our food pantry, four of which came in today. 
Over 5,000 students have benefited from the monthly distribution programs. That's the combination of the snack program, nutrition on the go, neighborhood market, as well as the um, food pantry. Because the food pantry, uh, excuse me, the food insecurity task force hopes to conduct greater outreach to our students, you have before you a flyer for the community food drive raffle, which will commence on January 24th. It will be announced at the um, COS West Hills basketball game. It will be conducted at the four Save Marts located in Visalia. We have a wonderful partnership with George Swagert, who is at the Noble Demery store. He's a wonderful force behind this. We will be raffling $1 raffle tickets. We have a 39 inch Invisio color television, which will be the raffle prize. All of the proceeds will come to the COS Foundation, the purpose of which will be to continue to offer this valuable resource to our students and conduct a greater outreach so that we can offer it to a larger number of people. Great. We're very excited about this opportunity. If you could see the faces of these students that we're serving, it would just fill your heart. So please know we are so grateful for your support and do you have any questions? Any questions, board members? Great. Thank well, you again, for coming thank you for this opportunity and I appreciate your time. Thank you for being here. Okay, so will we have raffle tickets at our retreat? Will you bring them to our retreat? That's too late. No, it's the 24th through the 13th. So well, it is. can I, I put it was you in charge of that? Steve, can you make sure that you have tickets there oh, okay. for us to buy at retreat? Because otherwise our next meeting will be too late, right? Or close, I don't know. Right. <laughs> okay. Are you up next? I hope so. Hi, I'm oh, you Steve. have public comments. Yes, I, I have was gonna say, comments. It's not your report yet. You're jumping no. way ahead. <laughs> I'm here to brag and answer, ask some questions. Okay, Steve. Uh, Steve Lamar, COS Theater. First, I would like to uh, brag a little bit. Uh, two weekends ago, I opened up the Fresno Bee Spotlight, and Donald Monroe, who's a reviewer, named the top 20 cultural events of last year. And lo and behold, number 11 was our production, uh, The Mystery of Edwin Drood, our COS musical. So that was, that was a surprise. And so I just wanted to say, looks like we're getting the word out about our theater events. And that leads to, last year, you know, we took Midsummer Night's Dream to LA and actually took the production. This year, it's in St. George, Utah, and you'll see on consent number, uh, agenda eight is our we're looking to take students to the, this year's ACTF Festival, and it's at uh, Dixie College in St. George, and so now we're looking to figure out how to get student 27 people transportation through the help of the foundation. Again, we are covering the uh, fees and some of the hotel costs, but again, we have to raise money. So any and all ideas uh, would be greatly appreciated because the program is this is, uh, uh, we're taking, I think, nine to 11 students that are actually been nominated to participate in the festival, and also they have to take acting partners with them, as well as technical award. So, should be very exciting, so if anybody <coughs> has any great ideas about transportation ideas, we would love to Come talk to me. All right. Steve, so, do, you yeah. have a, do you uh, have a list of the people that attend a lot of your plays? Yes. That might be a good place to start. Right. Tim and I were talking about that. Then so, <coughs> go ahead. Go finish. No. And next year, we just they just announced it's going to be at the University of Hawaii on Honolulu. So now, <laughs> now we're going to start planning Different way ahead for next quest. next year's February trip. Do you need a leave. trustee to chaperone that? Absolutely. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you and your private jet would be greatly appreciated. So, Steve. On, uh, in Utah, you are not taking like the show like you did no. on the road this time. There's this no is just participation. This is all the students participating it. in the acting scholarships and festivals. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we will move on to our board and executive staff reports, and we'll start with our student trustee report. Okay. So, since our last uh, board of trustees meeting, uh, we went into winter break, so not so much has been going on with Student Senate in general. However, our executive board did attend a advocacy workshop and training uh, where all the executive board members were able to get together over the <coughs> days and discuss upcoming events and um, just do a lot of networking. 
Uh, as a board, we discussed how important it was for us to all get this opportunity before the new semester started, um, because we had five new members coming in this semester, um, and uh, some <coughs> upcoming events. Uh, the <coughs> uh, a date has not been determined yet. However, we know it's going to be upcoming this month. And uh, Mr. Carsosa and I and Abby Gregory will be um, in attendance there. And also, um, Club Social and Club Rush are also in the, the works of being planned so we can get more student involvement on campus. So. Okay. Well, it sounds like you're off to a busy start. Do we have any yeah. questions, board members? Okay, thank you. Any board member reports? I attended the uh, basketball uh, foundation uh, fundraiser last Thursday. It was a nice event as usual. This is the second time I've attended that, and it was uh, it was a lot of fun. And uh, I think they probably did okay. Okay. Yeah, not all the numbers are in, but uh, <laughs> the gross numbers are good. Good, good, good. good. <laughs> um, well, last Thursday, as most of you know, we attended the ACCJC hearing. Um, Dr. Lasarna. President Carasosa and Dr. Trimble, who's not here. Um, and I, you know, it was one of those days that I, we went with confidence. We knew and felt, felt good about what we were doing, but I don't know that we knew how good we were gonna feel until we walked out of that room. <laughs> um, we anticipated it might feel good, um, but being able to sit in that room after um, two years of hard work and um, grueling hours on behalf of lots of staff and faculty at this college, I could truly say that We've done ribbon cuttings in Hanford and Tulare. We've broken ground on new facilities, which we're all very excited. <coughs> but I can honestly say, as a board member, um, I, it was a great sense of relief. Um, and 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 a comp I guess you know I wasn't the one sitting in these rooms till 10 o'clock at night, but I I could feel the sense of the college not only putting together hours and hours of work on what we knew we had to do to transform the college, but actually being able to say it's been implemented. And to do that in such a short amount of time, um, I just can't say thank you enough on behalf of our board, on behalf of the community, the students, to all of you. Um, Stan, thank you, Jennifer. I mean, and every, you, you, you know your staff. I know they've been thanked publicly, but on behalf of the board, we can honestly say that it's been, um, it, it's just a great, a great day for COS. Well, we'll wait till our letter, but um, I feel really good about that. And we had some smiles around the room that were a little different than what we saw last year. And I wasn't there two years ago, thank God, but we weren't <laughs> smiling when we got that news either. So thank you, thank you. Um, any other board member reports? Okay, we'll move on to our foundation report. Mr. Foster. <coughs> it was a slow month, but I got a couple of quick things I wanted to share with you. I did mention last, uh, last month that we um, had about a 40% completion rate with our applications for the uh, scholarships with which meant there was a, a thousand people that didn't that started the application but didn't finish so I surveyed those folks and we got 101 responses so it's not statistically significant um, a response rate but it, it did give us some key findings one um, mo half actually found out about the scholarship through their giant email and we only sent one email so we're gonna send more emails next time to make sure that we're we're recruiting as many applicants as possible um, we, despite the frequent email reminders, we had 39% that just uh, that, that just stated we simply missed the deadline. We just didn't. We just didn't make the deadline. Um, we also had 28% that they did they didn't know how to write an essay or or secure the references. So we're going to have some uh, uh, FAQs and some other uh, training mechanisms for that next round so that students don't have that apprehension and, and uh, we get some completion rate improvement based on helping them with, with that those two key things. Um, we had an open-ended question like what, what could we do better and we got a, a, a myriad of responses but they were categorized into uh, making giving more instruction on the essays and references. They were um, also asking for making it just make it easier if, if I could just say yes please that they would let that, I think. <laughs> they don't want to write an essay. But, but they don't want to write the essay, and, and I keep on hearing from the, the donors, um, the donors, especially the donors that, that uh, read and, and evaluate the, uh, the applications, and those that just simply volunteer to evaluate that essay is 
critical information, and so are the references. And so there's no giving up that, it's just trying to make it as, as, as pain-free as possible. And that's what we're gonna do. Um, I don't know if this one was joking or not, but he did say, have someone follow me around <laughs> campus and yell at me. So, <laughs> so <laughs> but really, I, I gotta say, of, of the 101, the, the, major, the majority of the um, responses were, uh, no, it's on me, you guys, you guys did fine, it was on me, I, I failed to do it. it was, so it was, it was refreshing to, to see the students own uh, that, that, that they missed. Missing miss. the deadline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we also had a wonderful year in donation uh, at, at the tail end of the year. It was a, a, it was a repeat donation. We had a donation uh, a few years ago, about three, um, for, for scholarships, to fund scholarships uh, here at COS. It was a $30,000 uh, uh, original donation. And uh, they just hadn't heard much from us, and so they reached out to us hey, um, we gave this money, we haven't heard too much lately. Um, and so I threw some back and forth with them via email and phone. Um, I followed up with them, gave them some information about the recipients of the, uh, of the nursing scholarships that they were funding, um, told them where, the, where those individuals were in the nursing fields now, which was great, they were already in the nursing fields. And um, so basically the tail end of those latter co last few conversations was, um, hey, you know, we're going to give you some more money, um, so you you know expect something by the end of the year. And sure enough, a check came in for fifty thousand dollars. So this is a donor that uh, doesn't want their name out publicly, um, but they do want to give it to COS, and they do want us to continue to uh, um, provide scholarships um, and broaden the scholarship application to beyond nursing, but to all medical field medical related pursuits. And so I'm in the process of uh, building that and. Um, recruiting a few more readers to uh, to assist with with administering that. So it was great to see fifty thousand dollars come in, uh, just in so pure philanthropy, just a quiet check in the mail. They didn't want a ceremony. They didn't want to give us a big check. You know, it was just it was just great. So it was nice to see. Um, just to follow up, also, uh, I think my last meeting I told you that uh, our avenue to education was just about to happen uh, at the uh, the Christmas tree auction, and we had some auction items that we needed to do to, before we knew what we finally received um, in total. We did end up netting fifty four hundred and fifty dollars. That was slightly under our six thousand dollar goal, but it was uh, markedly more than our thirty seven hundred dollars that we received last year. So um, we're on the right track. I don't like meet, not meeting our goal, but. Um, we'll see what happens at the um, next, uh, we have a chapter meeting in Hanford on Wednesday and uh, we might have a board member or two step up just to make the, make it uh, an even six, make so we'll difference. see. Yeah. Um, I also uh, left in front of, uh, for you three uh, upcoming dates of events. We have the men's basket, uh, I'm sorry, the men's baseball meet the Giants event coming up January 16th. We have the Tulare Chamber uh, Awards dinner coming up on the 23rd of January, and then we have the Hampered Rotary Crab Feed coming up on February 7th. One more that probably should be down there so people can get it on their calendar, the uh, annual COS golf tournament is gonna to be April 24th this year, so. Okay. And we're hoping to raise $25,000 net yes, for that, so. so. And we have our first meeting in a couple of weeks. I yeah, I think it's the 26th or 28th. Friday, Friday, so Friday at the Country Club. <coughs> Okay, any, any other, other questions? questions of Mr. Foster? Thank you, you're off to a good start. We're glad you're here. Yes. Okay, we have our accreditation report, Dr. Lacerna. Good evening, everyone. Um, Lori, da, or Pre Super <laughs> President Cardoza covered most of it, but um, as we have already discussed, we went to before the commission on Thursday and it was very positive. We, um, Stan was able to give a an overview of the past, what we've done over the past two years, and the there were no questions. And compared to last time, this <coughs> was really nice. And the one comment was congratulations. And the chair echoed that and said, he also said congratulations and through the report and they could see how all of the hard work that we've done. So again, for me, it was really, kind of, I didn't think it was gonna be that emotional, but it was really like the culmination of all the hard work, and the next thing I said was, let's throw a party. So <laughs> we're expecting that we should get the letter the first, the second week in February, so either Wednesday or Thursday, February 11th or 12th, we'll have an all-campus announcement meeting of 
um, and I'll get you guys once we confirm the time and the date of the results of the letter, which we are expecting to be very, very good so far that I will be ordering COS giant cookies and <laughs> non-alcoholic bubbly, and I'll be working with Tim on that, so. <laughs> but uh, it was very good. Um, but that being said, we still have, s we are in the constant process of accreditation, so there is a group that will be traveling in February to San Jose for a meeting that the Statewide Academic Senate is putting on on accreditation, and I'm working with Dr. Trimble on that, and I did wanna say that she let me know she would not be here tonight. and. Um, so we're working on that. The editing team, who were, was the group there at 10 o'clock at night, we're meeting this week to start talking about preparation for the self-study, who to send to that conference in February, and then also to look at our when we're gonna start writing the midterm report, which is due in October. So that group will start taking the lead. It's about halfway written from our other work, but we'll once we get the letter, we'll know exactly what else we need to address for the, the midterm report. So that is where we are right now with accreditation. Any questions? Thanks again for, for all your hard work. <laughs> Residents report. Okay, I will just um, piggyback a little bit on the accreditation <laughs> comments. President Cardozo and Dr. Lacerna have covered um, the bulk of our recent involvement interaction. One uh, other offshoot I wanted you to be aware of is that the Chancellor's Office a year ago put out an RFP for a state-funded grant proposal for community college to take the lead on forming um, what the Chancellor's Office wanted to term an accreditation, a, a, a pre-accreditation task force program. And I think the intent from the state chancellor's uh, perspective was to have um, some ownership as a chancellor's office and making sure that schools, uh, colleges and districts had a resource available to them through the chancellor's office to prepare for accreditation and to get uh, outside influence and outside evaluation prior to the accreditation actually happening. So. Um, College of the, of the Canyons District was selected uh, to fulfill that RFP. Their president is Dr. Diane Van Hook, who has a long standing, very positive reputation in the community college system. And um, she sent letters out to all of the community college presidents and chancellors over the winter break. I received mine. She was not only inviting colleges and districts who may have an interest in being part of uh, a pre-accreditation program so that task forces or a what they're calling technical assistance team could come and visit my college to help me get better. But she also opened the door for um, colleges who feel like they have uh, gone through experiences that would make them worthwhile members of these technical assistance teams to come in and help in a pre-accreditation environment do some self-study and help colleges do their analysis to be able to strengthen them and help them be better before their accreditation actually occurs. Her and I had an hour-long phone conversation today on the phone, a delightful woman. I've met her a couple of times, um, but the long and short of it is she's not only really impressed with COS's recent accreditation story and, and our, our quote-unquote show cause turnaround, if you will, but she's excited about COS um, participating as both members of the advisory committee for the grant and on the technical assistance teams. So um, it's going to be nice to be able to continue to contribute in ways beyond College of the Sequoias, all that we've done in the last two years here to be able to help other community colleges. She did say too that of the letters that she sent out, she got 27 responses from districts who are interested in having a technical assistance team come to visit their college. They want to get better and they want to know how to do that prior to their accreditation. That might, that might have been good for us. <laughs> right, right, and that's what I shared with her. And then also wanted to thank all of you who were able to attend convocation and let those of you who weren't able to be there that the convocation went uh, really well. We also had the opportunity to entertain a guest presenter for our academic faculty who was here, uh, Dr. David Marshall um, from uh, CSU San Bernardino, yeah, who talked to us about student learning outcomes and how they tie into program level outcomes. Everything was well attended and um, uh, very positive feedback on the on the day 
It was also a time when academic senate was seeking a vote of their um, faculty. They needed a vote of 50% of the entire faculty plus one to be able to pass their new constitution. And they announced at the end of the convocation uh, and the extended period where faculty were attending that the uh, vo vote was a success and the new academic senate constitution passed. So those are all positive developments. Wanted to remind you all that we do have our annual board planning retreat coming up. It's a week from this Friday. It's Friday, January 23rd, and Saturday morning, um, January 24th. We'll be getting the final details out to you. We are back in Visalia this year. Remember, we rotate between our three campuses. This year, we will be in Visalia, but off-site. And I'll get you the details, but we're at the Buckman <coughs> Mitchell Conference Room. And uh, Megan and I are working out the final arrangements for all of that. Format will be, uh, in terms of time frame, will be similar to our, our recent years where we go all day Friday and then uh, the morning on Saturday. And then finally, I'd like to take a minute during my time today to um, offer some special comments and, and acknowledgement. Um, Eric Middlestead is back with us tonight as probably one of his last, if not maybe his last official duty with College of the Sequoias to be here for this presentation before the board on our solar um, project. But I didn't want this last board meeting or Eric's last board meeting with us to go by without um, making special mention of his contributions to College of the Sequoias. I shared with Eric in an email and then um, personally when we had a chance to talk how much I appreciate the effort and the work that goes into not only facilities planning, but actually carrying out facilities construction. We all know that um, facilities and construction are the more glamorous things that we get to do because they're physical structures. They get supported by the taxpayers. They get built. Everybody gets to come in and admire the new things and, and marvel at the advances in the technology and the, and the sophistication and all of that. But I think the one thing we overlook sometimes is how those structures provide that permanent opportunity for improved access and, and improved education for students over generations. So Eric in his role shepherded hundreds of millions of dollars in the development of the, the um, big projects which included the Hanford campus, uh, the Tulare campus, and the entire Visalia modernization. I don't think that's any small feat. And so we're really proud of you, Eric, and we very much appreciate those contributions you made to serve education in our region and College of the Sequoias. We're excited for your new opportunity, um, a great opportunity for you and one that we, um, we support and believe that you deserve. But um, tonight I wanted to say publicly before the board, thank you for all the contributions you made to the students, the staff, and the faculty of COS in our district. Your imprint is here forever now, and I think that's something that we'll, we'll um, cherish for a long time to come. So thank you very much. Do you have any board member comments for Eric? I, I, we're we're going to miss you at board retreat with your three-page facilities plan. It's just every year gotten smaller and smaller, and we've crossed them off the list, and we've watched uh, I know a few of those projects, John, Greg, for sure, Earl, Ken, seen a couple, but when I first started on the board, that list was long. Uh, the Tulare Center was just a little, kind of a dream, actually. Um, and to see how much has gotten done in the last decade at this college is truly amazing. So on behalf of the board, I thank you. Any other board member comments? No, I, I uh, maybe more than the rest have been around, but you do somewhat, and uh, your, work, your work is exemplary. Thank you very much, Eric. I saw the position you're going to, and I don't blame you for leaving. That looks like you're having an opportunity. <laughs> and uh, I don't think you need any luck, but good luck anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Well, Eric, you won't be here to get harassed <laughs> by me about change orders. Uh, but I do appreciate all you have done. You and I came on board very close to the same time. And uh, I appreciate everything and your friendship and everything that we've had over these years, it uh, has meant a lot to me. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you and good luck, Eric. Thanks, Eric. Okay, moving on, we will go on to reports. Um, so it doesn't look like we have Academic Senate or a Costa report, is that correct? Correct. correct. 
Okay, so we will move on to our CSEA report. No report. No report. First day of school. We've been busy. <laughs> right. And do we have a Kasafa report? No report. No report. Thank you, Mr. Nickel, for being here. Um, on to our information items. Our first item up is our actuarial study of the retiree health life of the staff. Good evening. Our first item tonight is um, the actuarial study that we have done every two years for our OPEB fund, which is our other post-employment benefits. Sorry, not our, the fund, but the liability. <coughs> and um, we'll walk through that pretty quickly tonight. Uh, the report is dated November 1st, and I wanted to note this. In the past, it's been dated December 31st. Our actuarialist moved it up for us. He gave accounting cycle reasons. I don't think it matters really any particular way, but it is dated November 1st. The total accrued actuarial liability is $11,342,602. Um, that's the amount we need to make provisions for. If you were to look back to the last one a couple of years ago, it was actually 13 million and something. And I, I believe that our cap that we did impose changed those calculations for the out years. Um, so we need to make provisions for that. We do have provisions with a, an asset held in trust in the amount of $6,056,322. And so our actual shortfall of the um, actuarial accrued liability is $5,286,200. Um, there is something called a negative residual uh, accrued actuarial liability that you'll see in here. It can be very confusing. It was a little confusing to me. It simply means that the college is ahead of where it was anticipated to be at this point in time over a 30-year amortization period, but that doesn't change the fact that um, colleges and educational agencies are encouraged to pre-fund this to the extent that they can. I, I like to think about it like we think about um, retirement funds. We fund now for all of our employees to have retirement when they retire. Back in the day, health insurance used to be a very nominal cost, and there was really no concern about pre-funding it. Where we are in today's um, day and age, health insurance is very significant. So this is that whole move to um, pre-fund health insurance in the same way that we pre-fund retirement benefits, and these are the health insurance benefits. Um, again, we're not forced to, but we are encouraged to, and any um, remaining liability does have to be shown on our financial statements. Uh, there's also, I won't go into the, all the details, but GASB, the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, is actually changing this accounting standard a little bit additional. They're doing something called decoupling the accounting fund bases, um, changing how they refer to the liability. But uh, for you to know, this then is amortized over a 24-year period instead of a 30-year uh, because those years are marching down. Um, and then. We would hope to bring later uh, information to you later for discussion regarding how we might want to continue to fund the OPEB Trust. So are there any questions? This is just information tonight. We will be touching on this at Board Retreat, correct, a little bit, or no? To the yes. extent that you have any additional questions, I think the thing that we'll probably have a little time to discuss at Retreat, rather than the actuarial, it's <coughs> you may refer to it in trying to decide how best to move forward with our, our opportunity to consider resuming annual contributions okay. to the fund as part of our budgeting process. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Any questions? Nope. nope. Okay. We don't have a goal as to when we want it paid up. And we haven't. Uh, we, we, haven't, we haven't set that. But that's part of what I think is uh, up for conversation. One, do, do we want to establish a goal like that? Number two, uh, do we want to resume some sort of a general fund uh, allocation annually toward that in addition to the pay-as-you-go model? Remember, Greg, we retreated to pay-as-you-go during the difficult fiscal time. We just couldn't carry on anymore. Now that new resources are coming back and it looks like the budgets may be better for the next couple of years, do we want to establish a position now so that we can um, consider resuming some sort of payment into the fund above and beyond our pay as you go. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. <coughs> okay. And item number two on information is our update on our solar energy project. Ms. Stanton. A 
Okay, I heard there's something like a first ever national college football championship tonight, so yeah. I'll try not to go. You're already Maybe 20 minutes into I it. I know, I was thinking perhaps, <laughs> <laughs> perhaps we could get you home for halftime. But anyway, so this is a, uh, a large item for discussion. It is here for, before you tonight for information. <coughs> So you have a little time to think about it. We are intending to bring it back for approval at the board retreat um, to move along the timeline we've kind of pursued. But we have uh, Eric here tonight who, who has worked long and hard on all this information and he can be available to answer questions. We have Clyde Murley, who's our consultant from the California Community Colleges, I got it wrong, California League of Community Colleges. Did I say that right? I am reversed it. And um, he's our consultant that has helped us with all the expertise and the, you know, minutia and the fine detail of this process. And then Fanon, mm -hmm. I'm going to forget your last name, Araya. Fanon Araya is um, the project manager from the company that we are proposing to use tonight, Borrego, and very knowledgeable in solar and I'm sure could provide a lot of additional information as well. So. I've got this. I think what we're going to do is walk you through a PowerPoint. Do I? Okay. So first of all, I won't go through all this detail, but this is our timeline. It did start in 2013 with the Dean of Facilities beginning all the research. And then in December 2013, we did sign the agreement with uh, the Community College League of California, got it, uh, who sent us Clyde Murley to help us uh, with consulting services on this. In January 2014, we applied for a zero interest California Energy Commission loan. We amended it here just in December when we finalized our proposal. And so you'll hear me referring to the CEC loan, which would allow us to have a zero interest loan to fund this project. Um, April so you're saying we got that loan? I'll, I'll explain that a little bit oh, more. Okay. In essence, we do. We do have okay. it. And, and our intent is to not proceed without it. There's some fine um, final details for them to wrap it up with a bow and send it to us. Um, April 22nd, we had our special study session here with the board and we reviewed various possibilities of adding the solar at one or more campus sites. And then June 9th, you did authorize to us to issue a solar RFP, a request for proposal. We issued that September 29th. Uh, it was out there for almost a whole month. We performed a job walk in October. October 31st, we did only receive two proposals back. The the RFP was almost as big as this agreement. I mean, it's a, it's a very cumbersome process. And it was two of the largest players in California, very well-respected companies. And so they were very good submittals. And it still allowed for that element of competition in what was submitted. Uh, December 5th, we held interviews with the two uh, solar design build providers, Borrego. And the other one was, why am I already forgetting? Sun Power, which is a very large provider here in California. Um, December, during the month of December, I wanted to share this, we've, um, we selected Borrego as the most promising proposal and that begun basically a lot of negotiations. We worked with um, our consultant Clyde, we also worked with legal counsel, helping us draft and craft this agreement. And there is a lot of back and forth to drill down to what we believe is the most cost effective proposal and the best option for our district. And so that's what's before you this evening. Um, the cost savings projections, there was one, uh, a sheet that was prepared by Clyde. It's probably in the front of your big packet. If not, I may have put a separate color sheet. Yeah, you've got it. Okay. We'll, yes, oh, thanks. I, and we'll go into that. I'll go into that in just a little more detail as we move forward. But it does show six point, almost 6.5 million in savings over 25 years. Um, if you discount that at a discount rate that might account for inflation and tomorrow's dollars today, that would be closer to 4.5 million. But that's all on that sheet we'll talk more about. It does assume a 25 year life. Um, it, the industry norm is really 30 years, so you would have more savings if you look at that 30 year mark. Um, and almost anyone you talk to, whether it's the solar companies or Clyde or others who have put in solar, they say these panels are built to last 40 years. I just don't like relying on that because I don't know, I, I have a hard enough time assuming what technology is gonna be like in 25 years. But they're, they're um, a reliable source of energy 
and they do have very long lives. And we are actually purchasing and building our own solar um, project here. The size is 893.76 kilowatt, just shy of one megawatt. Uh, the cost for this contract is 2.835 million for the contract price. That's what's being proposed. Um, there are 165,000 in there for soft costs, which is our legal, our inspection costs, um, and then some small contingency or room for unexpected costs that may arise. Um, it does show positive cash flow savings each year, 238,000 to 260,000 the first five years. Those, that's because of these incentives that we are applying for and would come in. And the following years, I said the next 10 years, but it even goes on out, is the 125,000 to 220,000. Um, something I'll go back to, or let's see, we'll talk about the 3% annual cost escalation. Um, that assumes that your utility rates are going to go up every year anyway. So you're trying to project what is your savings. You need to include that cost escalation. I say it's conservative because I think I drove Clyde a little crazy. Um, the industry norm is probably a four to a four and a half percent. I did see um, what a neighbor of ours, a large district neighbor has. They assumed a 4.25%. So that's going to show them a lot more savings. When you drill that down to a 3%, it's going to have a very conservative projection of what kind of savings you're going to come up with. Um, their, their particular work with their um, experts and those that were doing the work for them said that the 30-year average around here has been 5%. I'm thinking it was closer to to 4% and I wanted to go with the 3% just to be really conservative. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, it does include the 0% 20-year CEC loan to finance the project. Um, it assumes an annual rate of output degradation at 0.5%. So they're projecting what this is going to save us in solar, but they're also knowledgeable that every year the system is going to degrade a little bit. It happens to all these systems. And that calculation is folded in to all these projections. Um, it assumes an avoided cost of 14.6 cents per kilowatt hour um, in the first year. And then that would increase by that 3% every year. That happens to be our actual average cost. I went back and looked at all of our facilities department spreadsheets. Um, and again, going back to another large district in the area, they were assuming a 17.6 cent. So you can see how when, if you assume high, of course your savings are going to look that much larger. Um, ours are very realistic, very actual. Clyde and I went back and forth on these, and he wrote what I call a white paper explaining, I won't even get into it, but all the reasons that you actually can many times save more than your pain on average because of it generating most of this energy during those hottest hours when you need most of the power. So there's more behind that. All that to say we could save even more. Um, it provides a 99% expected solar production guarantee. So this company, Borrego, is guaranteeing for us that what, that what they are saying will be produced in, in the terms of kilowatts, will be produced at least 99% of it. And then historically, I think when they go back to all their clients and check, it's usually over. 100% of what they've proposed. Um, it does provide near-term savings, long-term cost. It utilize, we utilized a full-scale usage analysis, I should say Clyde did, on our district meters. What are we using currently? Drill down and see, put that into the calculations to come up with your um, avoided costs or savings. Uh, it also includes the five-year California solar incentive. If it, Now we can kind of look at this page a little more specifically. If you look at those first five years, um, third column in, you can see that besides having these avoided costs, we, we have to start making payments. Those um, incentives are helping us make our payments on the loan, <coughs> the interest-free loan, and there is an operations and maintenance cost that we're now contracting for as part of this agreement every year. You can see each of those listed. So going through the 25 years, you have your avoided utility electricity costs, which we're actually going to lower our utilities budget by these amounts so that we can, in turn, pay the bill for that zero interest loan. And in addition, the first few years, we have the incentive payout, which does amount to that 748000 So that's very beneficial for us 
a little hard to see up here, folks, but I have this information if anyone wants me to send that to them. So you um, then subtract your operations and maintenance costs that you will be paying, subtract the CEC loan. It is a three million over 20 years, so 150,000 a year. And then you get to your annual net general fund benefit. Um, so what was really good news for us is that we should have a general fund benefit every year. We won't be having some negative years just to make this work. Um, <coughs> you know, I'll share, because I'm, I'm a skeptic by nature, I usually am, and I'm pretty darn conservative when it, things are fiscal, or concerns our uh, budget and things of that nature. But um, I, it took a lot to win me over, but this proposal did win me over. I think it's fiscally sound and I think it's probably good for our district. So it's kind of exciting to see what we can actually do with solar. It's not a, not a real large project either. Um, and I can answer questions at any point, but the project itself, if you were to read, <laughs> it's 100 pages for the agreement um, for the solar project alone. And then we have attached um, some other portions of the agreement, such as the output guarantee, guarantee and the <coughs> maintenance. But what it does include is a fixed tilt carport shade structure here at the Visalia <coughs> parking lot, which is 30% of the project. It's actually kind of a small portion in the northeast quadrant. I'll show you a picture in a moment. Um, two carport structures, each covering a double row of parking stalls. It also includes a ground mount single access tracking. So tracking means it would move as the sun moves. Um, solar field at Tulare camp campus, which is 70%. That would be south of building C, just north of m and building, um, and north of the form farm complex parking, which I'll show you in a minute. The panel cleaning would be provided at least twice yearly by Borrego. It would be as needed, maybe more often. Um, <coughs> something I kind of pushed for is they're gonna even bring in their own water to clean the panels, and I thought that was helpful to us. And then there's an inverter warranty. The inverter is what basically runs this solar production, and it is uh, a full warranty for 10 years, and then a fixed cost should we choose to extend that for another year. And each panel, I think there's numerous inverters, right? In the, in, inverters, yes, 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 throughout the different panels. So uh, the agreement itself, this large document, primarily is the design build energy services agreement and then um, and again that's about a hundred pages and if you get down our pages don't really work that well but it's j1 um, is the output guarantee agreement that's where they're saying we are going to monitor this they're actually going to have um, internet access and all the software to monitor the output in real time and they're guaranteeing what will be the output will be um, and then in addition, the last two documents, which are a little smaller, are the Master Operation and Maintenance Services Agreement, which covers um, most of the maintenance and operations service. And then the very last document is the actual cleaning services agreement, module washing. Uh, Borrego Solar, uh, Fanon could probably say a lot more, but they have been designing and building solar systems for over 30 years. Uh, their information stated that they had done five school districts in Northern California in the summer of 2013 alone. So they do this quite a bit. Their headquarters are in Oakland and San Diego, California headquarters anyway. Excellent performance guarantee. We felt really good about their performance guarantee. And they're very financially sound and have a strong reputation, especially with K-12. Haven't done that maybe three or two or three community colleges? I'm trying to remember. Two, okay. So, um, the Tulare campus, this is a ballpark picture of what it would look like. Um, again, it's a solar field. They are the tracking panels, and it would have a fairly inconspicuous fence around it there. How many acres? Did we end up with I'm six or... Sure s And the Visalia campus, um, again, I'll show you a picture next, but it's northeast quadrant, just two rows, not the complete rows, because we were basically trying to max out um, that the most beneficial solar and energy production for Visalia, um, College of Sequoias as a whole. And these are um, 
I think very nice looking and not too obstructive and I think people enjoy the shade when they can get it. Uh, for the Visalia campus, so again, this is the northeast quadrant right here. Of the new parking lot. Um, yes, parking lot seven. I'm okay, sorry, the picture the doesn't show. Not the new portion. Well, when you say northeast, I'm thinking, I'm thinking uh, over here. But you're talking about on this side. Northeast. You're right. I didn't lot. say I didn't say parking lot seven, which is our southwest new lot that we put in. Okay. Yeah. So the south boundary. That's yeah. So this picture actually doesn't really show you. This is uh, Shady Lane, and then Tulare would be right South there. Bound, boundary is mm -hmm. Tulare, right? Tulare Avenue. Mm -hmm. There so is. It will, it will go up against Tulare. No. no. Look, look at where no. it's pointing, Greg. Those are pullout boxes showing you down there in the yellow where it's going to be. Oh, okay. Actually, yeah, and and it's the shaded gray. The yellow might <coughs> refer to the. Um, Oh, ADA there, accessibility right? that's added. Yes. Right. So you're going to have to help me remember what we decided that, that there was some discussion early on about wanting to make sure that we didn't put something that was going to be in the way for something we might have in mind later, like maybe a parking structure or a chancellor's office. Has that been thought out? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, John, thank you. So if you were to look at that southwest parking lot, there's four quadrants. This is northeast. That's northwest, and then below that would be, I think that's it, or is the street, yeah, southeast, southwest. It's just not a complete picture there. So that's not too many at the bottom, that's the, no, I meant the bottom. Well, it's the center of the parking lot, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then to the right is Tulare. So you have uh, building A and building B. I think part of A is cut off there. And then you go down to the farm complex down here, and then the parking for the <coughs> complex. This is a maintenance and operations building, and this is the area that they're thinking of doing. Uh, we think about five acres, or planning on doing. That's our proposal. And we went back and forth quite a bit about what would be the best option for the Tulare campus. Uh, Eric, what was that, uh, the, the proposal for the Tulare campus, what was that property um, designated as uh, if, if we didn't do with the solar there? Was that? Right now, it, it really was long-term academic. I mean, we always had a solar field in the master plan. It was just a little more to the east. Um, right above the solar field, you can see the mm -hmm. gap. That's where the phase two That's project phase will two. go when it gets state funding. Mm -hmm. So we took that into, into play. And then what we want to do is put it, this, when we actually took a hard look at it, put it closer to the road, rather than just north of all the parking, up, that one day will be prime parking on the south parking lot. Mm -hmm. So the master plan actually just had academic buildings at this point kind of around that circle. So it, it's so long term, they're not defined yet. Yes. Uh, as I recall from our initial proposal, uh, and I realized that that initial proposal was a one megawatt system, I believe. Um, and, and I recall that we had the uh, discussion of the $3 million loan, and at the time we were one of our concerns was we were looking for funding for the balance of the cost. So I think this number is substantially less than what we saw before. Yeah, we and were so talking four million. We're about the same size. Yeah. And I suspect that has to do with it all not right. being the carport right. style. Uh, so that's I think yeah, I think there's multiple components that went into it, but we were looking at a one megawatt for four million. Yeah. I think the bids came in very competitive. You could probably speak to that more. And um, then wanting to maximize what we're producing, especially at Tulare, um, brought us down to that 8.93. But the four million was all <coughs> here on the Vice Area right. campus. Initially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Initially. Mm -hmm. so that's yeah, looks like a good proposal. I like it. I'm trying to see. Oh, these are our next steps, the last slide. Um, tonight's information only. Later tonight, there is a resolution before the board. It's authorizing the general project plans and it acknowledges proposed cost savings. Primary reason for doing that is it's needed <coughs> prior to entering into a solar agreement and it also had to be held at a um, regularly scheduled 
board meeting. So that's a public hearing and basically acknowledging the cost savings um, and allows us then to, of course, we will have your final approval, but enter into an agreement. Um, tonight, I'm sorry, where are we going? At the, yeah, at January 23rd, we do want to bring this back for the board's approval. The final CEC loan is expected February 11th, 2015. Um, as Clyde said, that's really kind of just a, what's the term you used? Been told it's an absolute formality. Yeah, formality. That the monies have been set aside for College of Sequoias, no question at all about that. And it's just the first opportunity for their board to, uh, their executive board to meet and approve. And have that action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, but the staff has assured me multiple times because I keep calling them and she keeps assuring me, don't worry, this is a done deal. And um, I share that to say we're still hoping to get approval at the board retreat so that we can um, at least have that conversation with Borrego and they can have some security in that sense. But we will not sign the paperwork until the CEC loan is approved to move forward. So that's everything, but I'm sure there's probably more questions and these folks can really answer details too. Yeah. Okay, so if it doesn't produce as much electricity as they said it would, what happens? Good question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure, sure. So the, the short answer is Borrego will, um, every three years, make a determination as to whether they've hit the 99% guaranteed level or not. If they have not, we, they will calculate an amount of monetary payment to the district that would make the district whole as if production was exactly at the 99% level. And that will take into account the California Solar Initiative that you're entitled to over the first five years and also the higher utility bills that you would be paying if they do not meet that 99% guaranteed level. I noticed they put in their proposal to wash the, the things twice a year. Uh, I'm going to perhaps, but I have a friend who's kind of an electronic nut and he put in two completely separate systems, totally separate side by side. Wash one of them once a week, and wait, and and let the other one go all summer without washing it. The power drop in the dirty one was 23 percent. Uh, are they assuming that they'll get the power they want without washing them? No, open? no. The requirement is that they hit the 99 percent level. The district insisted in negotiations on a minimum of twice a year washing. But if it takes every week, Borrego will wash them every week. They will be monitoring this on an hourly basis. Now, if the power goes beyond what they're required to give us, who gets that? The district gets yes. that. So then, future, we may decide whether it's worth it to us to pay more to wash it more often. <laughs> that's right. No, that's right. That that's the economic rational way to look at it. There might it might be worth additional washings, and I. You will get monitoring data every, every year. They will write you a report, and you can see after the first year how things are going, and, and maybe approach Borrego and say, we'd like to pay for additional washings. Or share the, share the revenue or something. Yeah. Sure. sure. Um, can you presentation, can you go back to sure. Jeff Graham on the right? Hi, everyone. I'm Fanon Araya with Borrego Solar. I just wanted to make a quick commentary on the, on the module washing topics. I, I get this a lot, and it's a great question, yes. So this project is the city of Kerman. Uh, they have a wastewater treatment plant, and last year we finished construction of a uh, ground-mounted single-axis tracker installation similar to the one proposed for Tulare. Now, you can't see it in this picture, but in some of the other images, the modules are covered in dust. You know, it, it's Kerman, Fresno area. It's very common for there to be a lot of, of soiling. However, that array produced 105% of its expected design this year. Uh, or excuse me, in 2014. So it actually outperformed its expectations. That's with the standard two, two module washings per year. So visually, it may look worse than it actually is. But typically, especially in the summer months, we're seeing 110, 115% of expected production. Um, and on an annualized basis, we are typically out, our portfolio, we have over 100 megawatts total under management. They are performing above 100% as a portfolio. So it's very common, especially in the Central Valley with ground mounted projects for our systems to outproduce our own expectations. Even when they're dusty. <laughs> yes. Long story short. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
I have, okay. a, I have a question. Uh, on the, it says uh, financially sound company was 69.5 million in asset, parent company was 6 billion. Who's the parent company? Parent company is Walson Lewa. They are a uh, metals company specialized in copper and other industrial uh, assets, and they're focused in t they're based in Taiwan, and they own 70 percent of Borrego. So, we as a company have the assets listed, but we also have the backing of uh, a six billion dollar publicly traded firm. So we're able to offer a 99 percent performance guarantee, and we can actually backstop it with our own balance sheet. But we also have that backing um, of that parent, of our parent company. Okay, say that name again. Walson, W A L S I N, Liwa, L I H W A. And you're publicly traded, huh? Yes. Perfect. Is, is there any chance of an automatic washing system? Is that cost effective? It would be nice. Uh, I don't think the technology has matured yet, uh, but our operations and maintenance team, we have our standard scope where our team comes out and will do the module washing uh, periodically. However, you know, as technology advances and the market changes, that could become standard. I am seeing some of that on the marketplace. It is still a premium product uh, where there are more robotic type of equipment that can, you know, there's a lot of panels. So that's the main issue is, is getting all of that equipment. So the market hasn't matured yet, but I think that could be a possibility in the future. Eric, a question for you. <coughs> Isn't the solar system on the nursing building, doesn't it have an automatic washing system? It does, but it's not It's not to the same level that Fanon would be looking at. The, the competitor company that we reviewed with them, they were going to use one, which was obviously less cost effective, or they would be here today. Um, and it was a robot that you would mount to, and it kind of robotically went across the panel, but it took a human a day to move those from row to row. What we have in the nursing building is more like a sprinkler system, hmm. where we put it on a timer, and every day, or every once a week, it just sprays some water across them, because we didn't, we didn't have a, a sophisticated system as what they have. I knew there was dust. I wanted to maximize it for a little bit of money. And then we have our uh, maintenance team check it once a month just to make sure it's functioning. So we didn't go as far as deionized water with a filtration system. I, I have two solar arrays at my home, and I do the same thing when in the summertime I'm washing down the hose. I just, so we didn't have the money to get a sophisticated or have a full-time monitoring system looking at everything they do. So we kind of hit the middle ground for what we thought was cost effective. Here, I think the big benefit that sold me was the guarantee. You know, if they if they never washed it, we still have the guarantee. So everything wrote on the guarantee. <coughs> no matter what happens, if it doesn't produce, they write us a check. That's I think was really the idea of the case. So in every instance where you said, well, you, could you do more of this or could you do more of that, you kind of came back to that guarantee and said, if they don't on their own, they're going to write us a check. So if if these need washed, you find that the efficiency has dropped such to where they need washed every month, let's say, as an example, rather than twice a year. Uh, do, who picks up the additional cost for washing? Do you want me to, we're all pointing to him. You know, again, it comes back to that output guarantee. So okay. they either want to meet the 99% guarantee um, and thus they will be sending more people to wash it more often and I could see them sending people much more often if needed yeah. or they're willing to write us a check because they're not meeting that output guarantee so okay. so they're pretty darn sure they're going to meet that guarantee they're, they're yeah. make it, we're so. quite invested in this project I had to fight very very hard to make sure that we gave you the most you know, cost effective while also uh, you know proposal while also focusing on risk mitigation. This entire project is just focused on risk mitigation first and foremost. So the 99% performance guarantee, we even worked with LG, uh, the module manufacturer. So it's made by LG Solar, which is a subsidiary <coughs> of LG Electronics, which makes appliances and TVs. We negotiated custom warranty terms for the College of Sequoia so that you have a full 25 year warranty that's guaranteed through LG Electronics, not LG Solar, the subsidiary. So if LG gets out of the solar business, that doesn't matter to you because LG Electronics will be backstopping the warranty for the full 25-year term. 
And that is, you know, it's just layers. So there's that, there's the 99% performance guarantee, there's our balance sheet that's backstopping that. Uh, so we're very invested in this project. <coughs> now, because of the Tulare campus having tracking, is there more efficiency there than in areas with the flat stationary ones? Yes. So the, um, the it's, a, it's been a topic of debate in the solar industry for, for a few years, and recently it's, it's become very clear that a tracking system that follows the sun uh, will produce so much more that it will overcome the slight additional cost premium over a fixed tilt system like the carport. Uh, so at the end of the day, you're, you're buying the commodity, which is power. And all that matters is how can I cost effectively attain that power. So even though there's a slight cost premium to having a tracking system, uh, you're going to see much more production and much more savings. Any other questions? OK, seeing none, can we move item 13 on our action item um, up to the up on the agenda and we can take a vote on that now since the topic is at hand. Yeah, I, I think since it's all fresh in our minds right now and we have Christine at the podium, that would be a great suggestion. <clears throat> okay, so we'll move on to item 13, which is our energy conservation project and service contract, which is resolution 2015-01, first one of this year. And do I need to start out with our public hearing first, just to open and close it, or is it all in one vote? Uh, I believe you do. Yeah. Okay, yeah. opening it, any comments? And I'm closing it. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, we are recommending that the Board of Trustees approve the resolution, and it's a rather lengthy resolution, but it was written by our attorney. What it does um, out of the government <coughs> code 4217.10 uh, and the sequence allows you as a board to contract with a solar provider or a design build firm uh, without going out for formal bid. This is how it's usually done really in our industry now because um, there's still competition when you do go out for a request for proposal. It's just not all the exact steps of a um, construction contract. And we're, in order to do so, we need you as the board to recognize, to acknowledge that you've read the plans, that they seem sound, but also that we have um, calculated and presented the proposed cost savings. And remember, this isn't, maybe Christine, could you just clarify again, mm -hmm. this particular resolution and what it's authorizing mm -hmm. versus us bringing the actual agreement back for a second reading and approval, which is a separate action. Yeah, this does not commit us to any agreement with the solar provider or to the contract. That That is the other that we will bring back to you. On the 23rd, correct? Yes. Right. What this does, uh, boy, I'm, I should look for the actual wording, but it says that um, in order to enter an energy service contract prior to entering into an agreement, the board of trustees must approve, sorry, authorizing the energy conservation project plans, acknowledging the cost savings. That's not saying it quite as clear. Um, a comprehensive review of the vendor's proposed design and installation services um, was completed. And under this provision, you're authorized to enter into that agreement. Um, provided that certain findings are made by the district's board of trustees in connection with such an energy service contract. And other than listing each of these findings, um, so it goes on to say that you've evaluated um, different alternative means of providing energy conservation, uh, that district staff have concluded that this is our best proposal at this time. Um, I thought about listing it. It's basically the energy generating facility is anticipated to generate electric power to serve uh, to Larry Campus and Visalia Campus, resulting in operational cost savings to the district by reduction of electrical power purchases from Southern California Edison. And we did post a notice of this two weeks in advance. And basically that you're finding that the cost, I'm gonna read it. Uh, is less than the cost for the district to obtain electric s electrical service from Southern California Edison to serve these campuses. So you're you're basically saying, recognizing or acknowledging that there are cost savings from what we are currently paying. Uh, Madam President, I move that we adopt resolution um, 2015 one I'll second it. It's been moved by Trustee Nunes, seconded by Trustee Sherman. Is there any further discussion? 
Seeing none, Megan, can you please pull the board? Trustee Nunez? Aye. Trustee Sherman? Aye. Trustee Nam? Aye. Trustee Zuma? Aye. Trustee Cardoza? Aye. Motion passes, roll call vote. We'll look forward to seeing it on January 23rd. Thank you. Thank you. It doesn't seem like a year ago we talked about this, but a year has no passed. Here we go. Uh, here we go. Save money. Yeah. Eric, your last project. Thank you. Sir. Thank so you for being here. Some change orders on it. <laughs> <laughs> I might just attend. Some of this. <laughs> um, okay, we will move on now to our consent calendar. All items listed on the consent calendar are considered routine. Will be entered or enacted by one motion. An item may be removed but from the consent calendar at the request of any member of the board or anybody in the audience. Do we have any items that need to be removed from the consent calendar? I move we approve the consent calendar. Second. Uh, moved by uh, Trustee Sherman, seconded by Trustee Mann. All those in favor of approving the consent calendar signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay, on our actions, um, item number nine is our re uh, affirmation of the College of Sequoia's mission statement. Mr. Carasos. Okay, one of the prerequisites to um, the later agenda item that you'll get a chance to see, which is a first reading of the district's master plan for the next 10 years, is to take a look at the College of the Sequoia's um, district mission statement. And so you can see from the background information that we've provided here in accordance with the steps outlined in our integrated planning manual, uh, we have completed a review and uh, any proposed revisions to the College of the Sequoia's uh, district mission statement and our recommendation tonight is that the board uh, reaffirm our College of the Sequoia's mission statement with a couple of uh, very minor um, revisions and you can see the mission statement as a whole still stands uh, firm in its uh, description of the district's mission and alignment to the district's mission with California State Community College System Minor adjustments were made in wording to focus on the college district, which imp implies multiple campuses now in the first uh, phrase of our mission statement. And then um, specifying specific access to programs and services that foster student success on the last portion of the mission statement. Our recommended action is that the board approve reaffirmation of this statement. Okay, okay. any further discussion on the mission statement? Or do I, can I get a motion? Move, we approve. Second. And a second, moved by Trustee Mann, seconded by Trustee Nunes. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion approved. Item number 10, board policy revised, BP 4230, or revised, sorry, BP 4230, BP 4231, and BP 5300, all for back for a second read. These, are, these are second and final reading for board action. We presented these. Uh, at our last meeting, you can see in bold and underlined what was new, and we reviewed that information with you. Um, if there are no further questions, recommendation is that the board approve these second readings. Uh, do you want to do these all at once or one time? I'm going to take them all at once unless you want to separate them. Okay, I'll make a motion that we waive the second reading and approve uh, board policy. Second. It's been moved by Trustee Zumwalt, seconded by Trustee Sherman. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion approved. Okay, item number 11, our um, College of Sequoia's Master Plan 2015 to 2025. That sounds yeah. so far away, but you, it's not. You all have a draft print document in front of you, and You're this is- you read it all, right? I am, page by page. <laughs> And, um, and that's the only thing that stands between this board and Oregon versus Ohio State. So the master plan first read is just to remind you that we've had numerous, um, a, numer a, lo a year long process to get to where we are today. We had a task force along with the Institutional Planning and Effectiveness Committee that's been meeting to uh, put together the master plan. We had the task force c uh, consisted of faculty, staff, students, and administrators 
administration. We had joint workshops with several committees on campus, and then we also had uh, meetings with our consultant and each of the academic divisions, as, as well as the student services divisions. We had um, several open forums about the, the um, master plan. We also had um, an academic senate summit regarding the master plan, and we've had numer numerous opportunities for feedback. It's been a standing agenda item on the district governance senate, as well as academic senate's calendars, as well as institutional planning and effectiveness committee. As you recall, we have four goals that we've established through this master plan. The first one is that the College of Sequoia's Community College District will increase student enrollment relative to population growth and educational and workforce development needs needs. Goal number two, the College of Sequoia's Community College District will improve the rate at which its students complete degrees, certificates, and transfer objectives. Goal number three, the College of Sequoia's Community College District will strategically tailor and implement academic programs and student services that match the needs of its unique student population and the demands of the ongoing changes in workforce development. And district goal number four, the College of Sequoia's Community College District Board of Trustees, administration, faculty, and staff will engage in be best practices and staff development to sustain and improve operational structures and systems for institutional assessment and continuous improvement. If you look at the document above in front of you, I will not be reading through it, but I just want to let you know the layout. We have at the beginning just background information. Chapter one, which begins on page 18, and I'm sorry, the page numbers are over to the left, and we'll. We're, this draft is still with our graphics person, so the February draft will be the fi final version with the, the beautiful graphics, but this is a first draft of that. So the first chapter, um, starting on page 18, is uh, the background and um, historical context. Chapter two begins on page 26, and this, this is the data chapter, and it formed the basis of all of our goals and where we, de where we determined the needs were in the district. Page 76 is part of chapter two, and that has um, the summary of all of the data presents our current and anticipated challenges. So that, that's, kind of, that's an important part that kind of pulls together all of the information in the, the data to what we, we foresaw as our challenges. Chapter three begins on page 84, and that gives an outline of the district goals that we just discussed, and then more in-depth discussion of each of those goals. Chapter four, let me get that one, begins um, on page, sorry. Oh, there's no page number on that, uh, 90. And that gives you, each page is a different overview of an academic or student services department, and it includes their anticipated growth for the next 10 years, as well as their current, their current um, course, successful course completion rates and what they're setting as their goals or their targets for 2025. And the last section is chapter five, is the facilities plan that's based on the academic or the educational master plan for Tulare, Hanford, and Visalia, and that talks about where we expect growth and, and any additional um, expansion or building over the next few years. That's a quick and dirty overview. Any questions or anything you want me to go over in more detail? The district is recommending that we approve this draft for a first read. Jennifer, is there any point, or when is the point in time that we'll actually measure what we've done to these charts in so this master plan? You the know, look at a division, and this is the target for 2015, and this is our average now. I know this gets looked at throughout the years, but where's the report that shows if these are all still good targets in five years? That would be our strategic plan. So if you remember, if you look at up here, the master plan is our 10-year plan, and our strategic plan is our three-year plan. So every three years, we give updates on how we're, we're doing on these object or these goals. So the next step, what we're starting now in January, is developing the strategic plan. In that strategic plan, we will have objectives that help us meet our goals. And so each, every three years, we'll look at that strategic plan. But on top of that, every year, you get the annual report on the master plan, which will 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 be a culmination of program review and all of the 
the annual work on so the if objectives. So something becomes obsolete, this, yes. this, um, this gets a changed. The, the it, master the plan, plan wouldn't get no. changed for 10 years, Just but we the would, strategic plan. the strategic Correct. plan would get updated and every three years. Yeah, and the, the three year cycles of updating the strategic plan are a way. Think of the strategic plans, Lori, as three sub chapters of this master plan. So they're updated on an annual basis, the, the information is reviewed on an every three year basis, those plans exactly. are updated. The collection of three of those is nine years or almost 10 years. It's going to be like a, an addendum to this plan. This plan was set, and then those every three year cycles were our way of keeping this plan up to date. Got it. Okay. So if something becomes obsolete in here in the next two to three years, it'll be reflected in the strategic plan three year kind of assessment that you do on this. Yes. Correct. Got it. <coughs> For that clarification. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the, the, and I don't remember, but the student senate had involvement in this also. Yes, we had rep we had two representatives on the master plan task force that met all of the le all of spring semester, and we had one representative on institutional planning and effectiveness committee, and we also have a representative on district governance senate. Two representatives on district governance senate. And we have student representatives on academic senate. So different pairs of students in their senator roles on these representative committees, about 10 different student representatives have seen this plan come through the role they play as student representatives on the different entities, Greg. Okay. And then in addition to that, I think on a couple of occasions, um, uh, uh, vice presidents have come directly into student senate when they meet on their regular uh, uh, meetings on Thursdays and made presentations to them in here, <laughs> especially on the student-specific information. And I, I apologize, if you look at on page eight and nine, it lists everyone who participated in on institutional planning and effectiveness. We had two student representatives, and we actually had four student representatives on the master plan task force. They're listed on page nine. We have their names in there, and, and it kind of that gives you an overview, page eight, nine, and 10 of everybody who participated in the in meetings, workshops, interviews for the for the report. Uh, Jennifer, when this comes back the second reading, all the work draft will be gone. Yes, we put draft on there because the graphics aren't finished, so we're working on final draft of the graphics, and we just needed another week to get that part so done. This is this is here as information only on the action agenda for a first reading. So the board would our recommendation is that you. Um, approve this as a first reading and advance it to, to a second reading and then we would bring it back for action again as a second reading. And to clarify, John, the draft, the, the content is complete. It, the draft is because we haven't finished the design for the graphics. We are well, working on that. I question that so much. I you to assure me that when it comes back to second reading, we'll say draft anymore. I will assure you of that. Do I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, or Madam President, I uh, uh, move that we waive the first reading. Is that right with you, Jennifer? We waive the first reading. Right, we're, which means we're not going to read it all tonight. Oh, yeah, unless uh, you want to start a We waive the first reading <laughs> and uh, 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 pass the master plan on to the second reading. Okay, do I have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion approved, all right. Um, our last item this evening on the agenda, thank you, Dr. Lacerna, is our non-resident tuition fee for 2015-16. Ms. Staff. Okay, um, each year we approve a non-resident tuition fee that our um, college district can charge. According to Education Code 76140, the board needs to approve that. Last year we are, 13-14, um, we were charged, I'm sorry, current year, 14-15, we are charging $199 a unit for our non-resident tuition. We are proposing $200 per um, unit for non-resident tuition. Reason we're proposing that is it's close to what they have been paying, and that is the statewide average. And there's about four or five different calculations you can choose from. Um, our actual cost is less than that but we are also not including the student capital outlay fee. I think there were a few years, at least about three years ago, when we included the student capital outlay fee. Um, at that time, we were doing a lot of capital projects, so that was like 40 or $50 per student. We were up around 240, um, and we lowered it a couple years ago. Um, 
under the recommended action, it does say in the middle which is the actual cost for COS. That is not true, and I apologize. That was an error, I think, in communication with staff and also my secretary putting this together. So if you do approve it, um, perhaps we could take that out. Which figure are you um, If you were proposing the, thank you, we're proposing uh, $200 per unit. Does it scroll? For, I'll let you do it. Well, to the recommended a, action. Oh, it's right, there, right at the top. On the side. Yeah, oh, there you go. So um, the 200 is actually listed at the top, but down at the bottom when it says um, it's recommended that the Board of Trustees set the 1560 non resident tuition rate at 200 per semester unit, um, just strike which is the actual cost per COS, for COS. What do you think that should cost you? It's listed right above it as $185 per unit. I don't know why that was lower than it has been in past years. Linda, do you do those calculations? Typically do, but with okay. your Okay, okay. Can you I, charge more than the actual cost? Yes, there's, um, there's five, four or five different options and it is listed in there and I'm trying to see. Cost, District, average. yeah, we are, we are electing the statewide average simply because it's so similar to what we were charging last year. We can charge the statewide average, the actual district cost, actual district cost plus outlay fee, or no more than a contiguous district, or an amount between the statewide average and the district cost. Well, now, what is the uh, $100 foreign uh, country student application fee offset? What does that mean? I Let's see. I was assuming we collect the $100 application fee from non-resident students who are both U.S. Citizens, citizens and residents of a foreign country. It's deducted from their tuition at the time of enrollment. So it's kind of a... Um, so they pay the $200 yeah. per unit, and then because they're applying from a foreign country, we collect $100 of that to offset the cost of application for a foreign student. So they pay $200 or what? But then, when but they then it's enroll, they get it back. They get it back. Yeah, it's it looks like it's just an advance fee. I th so I think. Of work to go to <laughs> so they don't cost you keep the hundred bucks. Right. <coughs> and that's our way of recouping some of those costs. So, so if they don't end up coming, they have to spend. That's going to cost them a hundred bucks if they fill out the application and don't come. Otherwise, they oh, get okay. credited. Okay. Back. Right. Thank and you. And it gets credited toward the two hundred. That's right. right. Oh, okay. So so I thought maybe you were talking about the two hundred is pretty big, right? So their total costs are gonna be more than 200 because they're not gonna come and take a unit. Right. And that, that $100 application fee is coming out of that initially <coughs> and then restored to them. I thought there. maybe you were collecting $100 from foreign students and, or 300, I, I oh, didn't oh, understand. Oh, no, it's just an application fee, right. yeah. How many units are students we talking about? Uh, how many, many take about 15 units a semester? Oh, yeah. how many, I'm so sorry. How many, how, many how many foreign students? Yeah, how many foreign students, non-residents? Non I apologize that I don't have that information. I'm trying to rack my brain for. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, Can it's. Can please? Oh, maybe 40 to 50 of those would be accurate. Further questions? Can I entertain a motion? I move we approve the non resident tuition fee. Second. Second. Moved, moved by Trustee Sherman, seconded by Trustee Nunes. <coughs> Further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion approves. Thank you. Approved. Any further questions to take up more time so everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing none, meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>